I have the great pleasure of introducing this group uh, and this capstone is entitled the Marine Related Learning Networks. Um, this group of five SMEA students consists of Marlena Scrobe, Katie Dalton, Benjamin Kantner, David Bernson, and Henry Bell. And the client for this capstone is Leopoldo Gerhardinger, as well as many other individuals in Brazil. Um, Leo and I have been collaborating a couple of years as part of a Future Earth initiative. And he is the one of the founders of an ambitious program in Brazil referred to as Panel Mar that is supporting and creating networks of coastal leaders, policymakers, academics, and others to help ensure ocean sustainability and maintenance of coastal community rights. Learning networks are emerging around the world in the marine realm and have great potential, in my opinion, and Leo's, to help in the creation of institutional and human capacity. And these are themes that the students will be presenting upon. Uh, this capstone represents an ambitious global review of learning networks, uh, as well as uh, students have done an excellent job, excellent job conducting interviews of key leaders in various learning networks around the world. Um, they complement that with the consideration of relevant literature. Um, this work will assist Brazil and Panel Mar, as well as many other networks around the world who are employing such techniques. Thanks so much, Patrick. Well, we are really excited to present our findings from our capstone project on marine related learning networks. Um, like Patrick said, our client, Dr. Leopoldo Gerhardinger of the Panel Mar Network tasked our team with researching other marine related learning networks around the world. My name is Katie, and I will be presenting today along Marlena, Dave, Henry, and Benjamin. So the UNDP named the 21st century the network age, uh, recognizing that networks can empower people by enabling them to use and contribute to the world's collective knowledge. To define a network, we use a very simple definition, a set of actors or nodes connected by a specified tie that links them. A learning network takes that simple idea uh, and emphasizes the process of learning and knowledge sharing. To begin working toward complex ocean solutions, knowledge is often one of the first key ingredients. So when we say marine related learning network, we refer to these networks that prioritize learning and knowledge sharing um, and that operate within the realm of ocean issues. Our client is Pinal Mar, which is an emerging marine related learning network located in Brazil. Dr. Leopoldo Gerhardinger is an executive secretary of the network which connects members in academia, government, and civil society in order to promote collaboration and policy action within Brazil. The network does this by serving as an interface between science and policy. Here are some quotes from Pinalmar members describing why Pinalmar formed as a network. Pinalmar arose due to the urgency and importance of responding to global changes that affect coastal and marine ecosystems as well as populations and the difficult governance of the ocean. Another Pinal Mar member explained, the exchange of ideas, science, and philosophy among different stakeholders is of great importance. Pinal Mar fills this gap and connects institutions related to coastal and marine issues in Brazil. So the goal of this research is to contribute to the current understanding of the emerging concept of marine related learning networks examine which network components contribute toward their effectiveness and identify areas of future research. So we collaborated with Pinal Mar to develop three primary research questions that guided our research. The first was what are marine related learning networks and why do they form? The second was what attributes contribute to the effectiveness of marine related learning networks? And the third question was what are the outcomes of marine related learning networks and how are they affecting marine resource management and governance? After an initial literature review and broad search on existing marine related learning networks, we then conducted semi structured interviews with expert informants who are working or have worked in leadership or other core capacities with marine related learning networks around the world. We interviewed between one and seven informants from each of the 16 networks, depending on the size of the network and the availability and responsiveness of the informants. All interviews were conducted and transcribed between November 2019 and January 2020. 
We developed the six themes shown here during our interview process by using a grounded theory approach. Okay. This graphic illustrates the breakdown of the quotations of six theme categories that developed through our approach. Rationale, operations, leadership, participation, outcomes and activities, and other emphasis. The other emphasis code allowed us to highlight key challenges, lessons learned, and external influences for our other five categories. These are the 16 networks included in our study, organized by scale. During the early stages of our capstone project, we conducted a review of current marine-related networks operating around the world. We wanted a diversity of networks based on scale, representation, and their goals. As you can see from the list, there are six global networks, seven regional networks, two national networks, and one local network. If we were to expand on this research, we would love to include more national and local networks. This map displays the locations of our informants that we interviewed. Through in-person meetings, phone calls, Skype, and Zoom, we were able to interview 22 informants from the United States and 18 informants from 12 other countries around the world. And now onto our results. So why are learning networks needed in the first place? Although the learning networks in our study exhibit a variety of histories and forms of collaboration, it is important to note that their motivation for developing is based on the needs of the network participants and the communities they serve. This inclusive approach is an important characteristic of learning networks that sets them apart from other silo approaches to marine resource management and governance. Their need for development stems from three core related challenge themes. Challenges relating to the ocean and coastal environments are complex and constantly changing they transcend governance boundaries, and those taking action to address them require urgent access to resources and information. An advisor in a regional network shared an impactful story of why their network first formed. A few fishermen had died in a boat sinking, and so the leader of the network sort of took it upon herself to take action and make it her own thing, as opposed to waiting for someone else to solve their problems. Numerous informants echoed this sentiment. Their challenges, the challenges their communities were facing demanded action, but they could not wait for outside help. And in many cases, relying on outside help was often costly, inefficient, and did not incorporate the perspectives of the community members. With regards to knowledge creation and knowledge sharing, there are two motivations for learning. The first is that nascent marine related issues and areas of focus are providing an impetus for researchers managers, and issue-related societal actors to come together to develop and share new knowledge. The second is that although knowledge, including best available science, technical expertise, traditional ecological knowledge is available, this information is not in the hands of practitioners and others who are closest to the issues. In other words, those who need it most. With regard to network definition, our results indicate that there is no one way to define these networks. This diagram shows the diversity of terms used by informants in our 16 networks according to network scale. Some of the most common terms used were learning networks, peer learning networks, knowledge networks, and just networks in general. The terms varied across and within networks, with informants often referring to respective networks as one of the more listed terms. Informants described the differences in terminology often related to cultural context, the needs and organization of the network, and what the overall goals of the network are. However, they do share numerous traits such as prioritization of learning, trust, value placed on participants, and flexibility within the network and to external challenges. Distinct traits have to do with the structure and outputs of the network, such as whether or not they advocate for a certain issue. However, as this is an emerging field, one leader in a global network noted, it was more important to ask what the networks were doing versus what the networks were calling themselves, which brings me to my next topic, the goals. Learning networks in our study have a diversity of goals, which is to be expected given the array of complex, wicked problems surrounding our oceans. But they all work towards improving the health of the ocean and the livelihoods of those who depend on related marine and coastal environments. The most important first step for any learning network is to define their universe, meaning determining why the network is needed, who is involved in the network, what the goals of the network are, and how they plan to achieve them. This is essential for the success of any network. With regard to membership, there are generally two types of networks, networks that connect peers, practitioners, or managers of a similar sector, and networks that connect individuals 
or organizations from different sectors, including science, policy, and society. The next step in a network's development is goal setting, which may evolve over time as the needs of a network shift. Goal setting is difficult and tedious, but very necessary. It is a two-fold process that involves figuring out the needs of participants in the network and the communities they are serving, as well as the skills, expertise, and knowledge that the network participants can provide. All right, so what do these networks actually do, right? Um, so they're, they're putting on lots of workshops and trainings, often uh, building capacity of marine managers or developing leaders and educators to further strengthen local governance or resource use practices. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer aspect is also very important for many of these networks. Um, for example, they might be helping to fly uh, MPA managers from the Caribbean to Guam to share reef management techniques. Uh, or bringing together small scale fishermen to learn about sustainable management practices from one another rather than from policymakers or conservation NGOs. They're also uh, running forums and meetings. They're participating in major conferences. They're contributing towards ongoing scientific uh, data collection initi initiatives, and they're collaborating on a plethora of publications and developing products typically with very um, specific uses for these things. Great. So now that you know a little bit more about um, what networks actually do, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the operational side, sort of the nuts and bolts of learning networks. Um, administration in particular was often considered a main challenge by our informants because funds are usually dedicated for activities and projects and not for the uh, maintenance of the network itself. Um, in particular, the network coordinator emerged as a really important administrative role, um, as pointed out by this key informant from CTI. We always come back to the principles of a learning network. You need a clear purpose and a dedicated coordinator, some key resources, otherwise it's not going to happen. Informants also emphasize starting small and working incrementally to manage growth, emphasizing the concept define the universe that Marlena introduced. What is actually feasible given the available resources? This approach is really key because our informants stress that learning networks should be long-term investments. Their value is derived from developing these lasting relationships. So limiting the scope and growing incrementally really makes managing the network for the long-term possible. However, the fact that funding often comes in short-term sequences can make this really difficult. Uh, network administration also needs to be able to adapt to um, issues that arise um, and to the involving needs of their members. So in order to be responsive, they need to make sure that their activities are well targeted um, and that really requires being reflexive and adaptive. Together, these elements allow uh, the network to run more efficiently. With the appropriate capacity and resources, they can provide the attention, communication and reciprocity for participants to really feel like their engagement in the network is valued. And so this brings me to my next topic, which is communication. Um, this is really the core of learning network activity. Um, and all of the networks that we interviewed used multiple communication methods to engage their participants and their members. Um, but informants really consistently emphasize that in-person activities are the most critical component of network communication. Uh, when networks are able to provide the space for informal interactions within those face-to-face -face activities, more trusting connections and relationships are cultivated. And when trust is established, more meaningful learning and dialogue are enabled in the network. As evidenced by an informant from Big Ocean, you have to create the conditions where people have trust and are willing to be vulnerable and bring the real issues to the table. This is not to say that online communication and um, other virtual modes are not important. Um, they are definitely widely used and can be really effective, but they're most effective when those relationships have already been established in person. Uh, using new technologies that allow for more interactive and efficient exchanges online can be really powerful for connecting people that may face travel barriers. Uh, but that doesn't solve uh, the issue for people who face other barriers like uh, lack of access to high-speed internet or electronics. So technology can both enhance and limit uh, connections among network members. And that brings me to my last theme, which is metrics. Um, so in order to justify funding and investment, networks really need to be able to show that they are successful and are meeting the needs of their members. This can be particularly challenging for learning networks because their activities are not always linked to specific indicators of success. Basically, it's really hard to measure learning. Uh, like one informant said, measuring our impact is really difficult. We try to get statistics wherever we can, but how things are used and implemented on the ground by people is hard to know. So this is where qualitative measurement methods come into play. 
A story, for example, can show how the network influenced a particular person or community. Uh, this table here shows a generic breakdown of the different metrics that our informants discussed and the associated ways that they track and measure those different components. The distinction is really that process-related met metrics um, are more quantitative, while outcome-related metrics require more qualitative measures. And since learning networks are process-oriented, metrics that indicate levels of engagement and participation are often just as important as the outcomes themselves. Like this informant said, we know it's working because people keep participating. But being able to monitor both process and outcomes means that you need to know what success actually would look like. Well-defined goals and a clearly outlined theory of change can really help networks navigate the challenges of monitoring these often intangible outcomes and impacts. All right, uh, this is Dave and I'm gonna be talking about uh, components about network leadership and I'm gonna start with skills and qualities of network leaders. So we asked our informants what skills and qualities make for the most effective network leaders and we received a variety of responses. Uh, the suite of skills that make for the most effective network leaders depend on the leader's role. And certain skills or qualities can also be more useful depending on the stage of the network. So whether or not that network's just getting off the ground or if it's already established in a region. In general though, this diagram represents the skills our informants stressed most frequently as important. Um, several different types of leaders emerged in our discussions with informants. For example, one type of network leader identified by these informants, champions, are those passionate, energetic people that can get others to join a common cause and support network emergence. Champions are often community, uh, local community members dedicated to a cause, and they can also be early career researchers and women who frequently came up in our interviews as important leaders to include and develop in networks. Um, on the importance, or informants mentioned that they tend to be more passionate and energetic and engaged and on the importance of these early career researchers one leader of a global network said i really do think the focus on early career researchers and professionals is key because they tend to be engaged interested have enthusiasm new ideas and reason to participate because they're still building their networks and while pa passion and energy are great those qualities alone don't really support the longevity of these networks perhaps the most important network leaders are coordinators Coordinators are really, really great at doing what our informants stress as one of the most important network leader roles, trust building. In essence, coordinators are skilled at forging and maintaining relationships. They're really good communicators and facilitators, and they're really great at zooming out and seeing how all the different puzzle pieces of an issue can fit together. Next, I'm gonna talk about leadership changes and transitions. So inherent to sustainable management and most network goals is longevity. So it's inevitable that a network will have to deal with changes or transitions between leaders. These changes can happen for many different reasons. They might leave, leaders might leave for different opportunities, they might become burned out, or they might transition because there's actually clear governance structures like ruling committees in place. If there is no system in place to ensure that network momentum continues forward when key leaders leave, it can lead to stalls in network effectiveness. Governance structures that address leadership and leadership transitions within a network should be made very clear <clears throat> at the outset of a network's genesis. These structures or continuity processes, as one informant put it, can vary. Here's one example from a, legion, a regional network leader. Just for continuity processes, that executive committee has five people. Then you have three roll out and three come in and two stay, for example. So those rules of how to operate were developed early on, which is very good. That type of process works to attract new leaders, but it also works to retain key leaders. And it does seem crucial for networks to retain certain key leaders like coordinators that manage those big picture issues and maintain trust and relationship, relationships. One informant said that networks who can retain key leaders tend to be more effective than the networks who have a conveyor belt of key leaders coming and going. But it's also important for networks to attract new leaders who bring new perspectives and ideas. So developing governance structures that work to attract new leaders and retain key leaders is really important. Next up, I'll be talking about leadership development and in general, leadership development within networks can be formal or informal. So formal leadership development are those activities like workshops or seminars or online competency modules or mentorships. Um, and mentorships emerge as pretty important with our discussions with informants. Mentors exist both within network core teams or in the communities with whom networks engage. So internal mentors can ensure smooth key leader transitions by taking emerging leaders under their wings and community mentors can provide targeted assistance to other members of their communities. Network leadership development activities, whether formal or informal, serve to empower emerging leaders, which is a really important component of network influence. 
And this empowerment can actually be used by a network as a metric of their success. So when leaders who have been through network leadership trainings enter decision-making arenas, it really reflects well on the network and it can be a sort of captured win for that network. Moving on to our theme of participation, let's start with membership. Participation varies both in formality and involvement. Some networks have formal membership processes by which participants sign on as network members, including commitments to associated responsibilities. Other networks prefer to maintain a looser process to encourage more widespread participation. Beyond status as a network member or participant, involvement varies from simply participating in an email listserv to guiding network direction and seeking funding. Our informants frequently mention the expectations of network participants. These participants conducted work for various uh, networks at times and also on a volunteer basis, but with the expectation that their involvement in the network contributes to their professional development, either through formal trainings or adding to their resume. Interviewees acknowledge that networks tend to depend on a core group of individuals or even one particular motor who keeps the network running through leveraging personal capital and a commitment, along with a vision for the network's evolution. Although the supreme importance of such participants raises replacement fears, networks seem to accept this dynamic as unavoidable. Moving on to engagement, network participants expect their involvement in a network to benefit their career. This leads to the understanding that networks will cover certain costs and offer professional or personal development benefits. At the same time, investment must be reciprocal. Networks expect participants to return increases in personal capacity to the network in the form of leadership, technical skills, or even political connections. Sometimes the more development an individual received via the network meant they would move on to a different role outside of the network. However, this transition may be a sign of the success of the network's investment in building capacity for connected societies. We previously mentioned the importance of face-to-face -face communication, but we return to it again here to emphasize its essential role in engaging network participants. Informants were unanimous in their view of the primacy of in-person meetings and trainings to encourage trust, help participants feel listened to and valued, and create a feeling of solidarity between otherwise geographically isolated stakeholders. Some interviewees highlighted the challenges and frustrations of encouraging engagement through online mediums, such as discussion boards. Most interviewees stress the need for opening up engagement to all potential stakeholders. This can be challenging to achieve given the priority placed on recruiting primarily scientists or academics, including consideration of forms of knowing other than formal scientific or technical Cool knowledge may be a way to expand network participation beyond the usual suspects. We encountered three broad categories for the types of knowledge utilized by networks. Technical, including scientific knowledge, experiential, including practical lessons learned, and traditional ecological knowledge passed down through generations. Knowledge hierarchies pervade many organization types, and networks, unfortunately, are no exception. However, interviewees used lived examples to highlight the capacity of networks to break down knowledge hierarchies within and without networks, empowering horizontal rather than vertical collaborations. Just as knowledge hierarchies are not unique to networks, neither are limitations in participation occurring through north-south barriers. By this, we mean the challenges involved in collaborations across the socioeconomic boundaries of the global north and the global south. As specific examples, informants mentioned both travel visa restrictions and reliance on English and technical materials as two participation limiting factors. Finally, we found that network participation is often limited based on the network's preferred sociocultural perspective. Networks favoring academic or science heavy discourses often struggle to make inroads with traditional communities. Additionally, Interviewees express fears that if networks engage in activism, they will no longer be viewed as operating from an impartial scientific consensus. All right, uh, now we'll move on to the outcomes of networks. Um, 
So we've been talking quite a bit about how, uh, about building trust and how, and that actually in and of itself is an outcome. Uh, a network's prolonged and consistent presence in a region is a key component of establishing credibility, building that trust, maintaining member involvement, and ultimately achieving successes. Uh, over 50% over of our informants, representing 11 of our 16 networks, use the terms trust, family, or cultivating relationships when discussing their network and describing the sense of community that arises uh, and even the motivational support that the network can provide uh, for people carrying out difficult and sometimes isolated management jobs. This wasn't something we asked about, um, rather it was a finding that emerged as informants responded to other questions because they saw trust as such an important factor in how these networks achieved their intended goals. Uh, for example, in the Pacific, we have an informant from PIMPAC saying, uh, this network has been around so long, we've been consistent, and we have a good relationship with so many organizations, we have that trust and there's a strong sense of community uh, when talking about how they, how they uh, uh, have success. Uh, similarly, in the Mediterranean, we have an informant saying, you start to build a kind of family, and this is really key for MedPan. Um, so uh, learning networks also facilitate the sharing of good resource management practices. Uh, they build technical expertise and close information gaps, which allows network members to learn from others uh, rather than from trial and error. Uh, for example, network functions will uh, improve participants' expertise and ability to engage in things like strategic communications, uh, improving enforcement, uh, doing data collection, and uh, even responding to issues that emerge. Uh, so uh, speaking about a peer-to-peer -peer training activity conducted in response to stony, stony coral tissue loss disease that popped up in the Caribbean, an informant from MPA Connect said, the outputs from this meeting directly targeted the needs expressed by the managers. There were excellent efficiencies that came from a subset of MPA managers working with me on developing these outputs which we then shared with the rest of the network to save them from reinventing the wheel. Uh, networks also can address uh, government capacity and resource shortfalls by bringing together stakeholders to inform decision-making, building collective understanding of, of the need for action, advancing scientific or technical understanding, uh, or also serving as a platform um, for intergovernmental collaboration on, on similar initiatives. Um, so for example, we had this informant at the Coral Triangle Initiative saying, they've got a great viable marine protected area working with Timor-Leste. I think they wouldn't have had that if it hadn't been for CTI. The minister came away with the knowledge and the importance of doing that work and making it function. Uh, again, uh, in PIMPAC, we have an informant saying, we identified about 20 different policies, such as fishery regulations, that were implemented because they had science to show policymakers what to do. Um, I should note also that it, it can be pretty difficult to, to directly link regional or national level efforts of networks to improvements on local scales. Uh, and direct links to positive ecological outcomes are also hard to empirically establish uh, given the complexity of marine and environmental issues and, and the number of actors in, in these spaces. So networks, uh, they will also expose people to opportunities in conservation and management fields by providing them with a variety of arenas and platforms to, to share their perspectives, learn new skills, develop into better educators and, and leaders, as, as Dave discussed. Um, these informants also described how uh, networks can reduce resource accessibility and equity barriers by connecting members with varied backgrounds and across social and professional hierarchies. Uh, speaking about the, the Women's Leadership Forum, which the Coral Triangle Initiative set up to empower women as leaders in government, uh, we have an informant that said, the key women are actually quite active in their respective agencies. The forum is providing confidence to this particular group. They have a key role to play, and it's also engaging them in position making. Uh, finally, uh, these networks are developing a number of products that have really specific intentions for their use. Again, they're most often responding to needs that have been identified by members uh, or by larger society. 
uh, and, and the best products, they bridge these gaps in knowledge uh, or have a really applied use. So Big Ocean, for example, they developed the large scale marine protected area guidelines. Uh, you have networks like Reef Resilience and others developing manuals and guidebooks. Uh, and then uh, TBTI, they put together uh, a really great informational database on small scale fisheries, um, among uh, uh, many other products. So we'll conclude here uh, with our key takeaways. Uh, based on our research and, and that of others, we can say that these networks play a critical role in ocean governance. They emerge in response to issues that arise where there is an information gap or, or disconnect, and they mobilize communities and shared knowledge and resources to improve management and inform policy. Uh, the most important elements of an effective network, uh, first of all, we found that networks uh, that are most effective were those that were able to clearly define their universe. Um, in other words, they, they identified a need and established goals and priorities to operate in that specific space uh, and provide utility to those who need it, uh, drawing in participation and buy-in uh, buy to their work. Trust and longevity go hand in hand. Uh, un unlike many environmental projects and initiatives that occur on short time scales, maybe you know, clear start and end dates, um, the vast majority of marine related learning networks aim to operate over extensive period, uh, periods of time. In many cases, they're operating for the foreseeable future. So even uh, with limited funding, building, and trust, uh, building trust and operating over the long time spans allow these networks to be quite effective at achieving their goals. Um, so we know these networks often have limited funding available, but consensus was that their top priority should be hiring a dedicated coordinator that keeps the network moving forward, engaging members and partners, organizing activities. Um, these networks, they're, they're not self-sustaining. Uh, they, they really do require drivers or champions, and, and often that is the coordinator. Lastly, uh, a strength of the most effective networks is that they're quite responsive to the evolving needs of their members and they adapt to changing, condi changing conditions and emerging issues uh, sometimes on the fly. <clears throat> so these networks, they're, they're not a panacea. Decision makers can always refuse to acknowledge or util utilize information provided to them, uh, but they do help overcome some traditional problems of governance uh, given their limited resources. Uh, these networks pack a punch. Uh, they leverage existing knowledge sharing and disseminating it. Uh, they also promote on the ground improvements, often through capacity building exercises related to marine management or science communication. And they will bring together diverse se sectors of society uh, or otherwise engage with specific actors that most need information but wouldn't otherwise have access to it. Um, I'll conclude here by saying that the scope of this project was quite broad. There's many different marine related learning networks out there and, and they're working on a pretty wide variety of initiatives. Um, but, but to our knowledge, uh, before us, few if any attempts have been made to try and better understand what these marine related learning networks have in common, what makes them most effective, and what outcomes they are collectively having. A lot of our informants reflected that our questions helped them think through their experience in these networks and how they can actually improve their own work. Uh, and it was also humbling to hear them express gratitude to us uh, for working to put together the lessons they've learned within this emerging field. Uh, so our work, uh, it opens up a lot of different possibilities for future research into any of the different themes we covered, particularly by going beyond interviewing network leaders, and also talking with the participants in these networks. Finally, uh, we'd like to acknowledge all the, all the support we've received on this project. We're extremely thankful to Pine Elmar and Leopoldo, SMEA, and, and everyone else who helped us along the way. 